Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda. In this episode, we're going to take a look at Third Maccabees. Uh, Third Maccabees is an interesting book. It's found in some Bibles, both ancient and medieval, even some modern Bibles. Is it canonical? Well, the Council of Trent didn't accept it as canonical. And so in this video, we're going to look at the pedigree of Third Maccabees in terms of its canonical status. Is it rightly rejected as being non-canonical? Or is it a strong candidate for canonicity? That's what we're going to look at today. So fasten your seatbelts, folks, because the Apocrypha Apocalypse begins right now. All right. So Third Maccabees, very interesting book. What is Third Maccabees? Well, it's something of a misnomer. Because even though it's called Third Maccabees, it actually has nothing to do with the Maccabean Revolt. And it has no relation to First and Second Maccabees or Fourth Maccabees. It actually talks about a very different thing at a different time and a different place. Third Maccabees is a pseudo-historical work that accounts for God's deliverance of the Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, not Judea, like the Maccabean books from the persecution at the hands of Ptolemy IV Philopater of Egypt. And this revolt took place 50 years before the Maccabean revolt. So it's chronologically earlier than uh, the accounts in Maccabees, but it's counted as third Maccabees simply because of its place within codices of the Septuagint. In other words, it just so happens to be the third book after first and second Maccabees. It's not a continuation of second Maccabees. So it's something of an oddity in the Septuagint. But before we do that, I want to look at the pedigree of this book. In other words, what about its past when we're looking at it suggests whether or not it's canonical? Well, the first thing that we need to look at is the date of composition. When I think of the data composition in terms of the possibility of a book being considered inspired, that is canonical, by Christ and his apostles, I think the, the optimum zone for that would be prior to the time of Jesus. So anything that's written before AD 30, I think could be a candidate for being included within Jesus's Septuagint. And therefore that raises, I think, the possibility that this book could have been considered inspired scripture by at least Christ of inspired apostles. I think after 30, it becomes less and less likely that this book could be considered inspired because it simply wouldn't be part of the scriptures in circulation under the um, I guess, the heading or the style of Septuagint. When we look at the data composition, however, unless a book actually nails down a specific historical reference, it's really a matter of educated guesswork as to when a book was written. And unfortunately for Third Maccabees, there aren't really any uh, nails that you can hang a particular date on. And so scholars give us a range of dates of possibility. The early part of that range is 100 BC, which would be, certainly put it in terms of, I think, a greater possibility, maybe probability, that it would be part of Christ's Septuagint. The ending date would be no later than the destruction of the temple in AD 70, which would definitely put it in a period uh, where it most likely would not have been considered scripture or part of the, the Septuagint. So unfortunately, the data composition for Third Maccabees, at least as far as the scholars are concerned, and by the way, I've looked at several reference works, none of them want to put their chip down on an earlier or later date. Unfortunately, it's not decisive at all. It could be, it could go either way. It's actually right there on the cusp. So I don't think the data composition really gives us reason to doubt or affirm 
the possibility of canonicity or raise the probability, I should say, of canonicity. Another thing you should know is originally written in Greek. And so our next step would be to look at the New Testament, see if there's any references to Third Maccabees, allusions, does it ever use it in an authoritative manner? Uh, is it even aware of Third Maccabees? When we look at New Testament evidence for Third Maccabees, we simply find that there isn't any. For example, the 27th edition of the Nestle Olan Greek New Testament. This, by the way, is one of a couple of standard New Testament texts that most pastors use and scholars use. It, you know, it's a critical edition. In the back, it has an appendix of citations and allusions. And when you look in back, you do find a few uh, references to Third Maccabees in the back of the Nestle Alon. The problem is, as Barbara Alon notes, none of these instances raise it to the level of an illusion. And this is cited here in Croy. The 27th edition of the Nestle Land Greek New Testament lists seven passages in three Maccabees as Loki Citata Vel Allegati, but these are at most faint lexical or thematic parallels. None of them rises to the level of a likely illusion. So that raises the question, even if there's any kind of recognition of the book in the New Testament, is that positive or negative? Well, it certainly isn't positive. Uh, is it negative? Not necessarily. But in light of later evidence, I think it actually does have some weight to it. Uh, this apparent omission of any kind of illusion or reference or what have you, nothing substantial in the New Testament. When we move to now the great codices of the Septuagint, these come from the fourth and fifth century. Codex is essentially an ancient book. You know, it's bound together. It has several books between its covers as opposed to a scroll. So we have three major codices of the Septuagint from the fourth, fifth century. Third Maccabees is found only in one, the Codex Alexandrianus, or A. This is from the mid-5th century. It's also the most complete. It's got everything in the kitchen sink in, in uh, Alexandrianus. It's omitted in Codex Vaticanus, and it's also omitted in the Codex Synacticus, which are a little earlier. And they aren't complete. In fact, they're missing some folios. So uh, it could possibly have been in one or both of them. Uh, but I think, again, as we move chronologically through the evidence, uh, my general impression is that chances are it probably wasn't part of Vaticanus or Synacticus. Uh, it is found, however, 3rd Maccabees is found in the Peshito which is a Syriac translation of scripture, uh, which was made in, sometime between the 4th and the 7th century, and also the Arminian version of scripture, which was made sometime from the 400s to the 600s. So there are some later translations that do include 3rd Maccabees. Both of these are Eastern, uh, and uh, both are somewhat late. I think... A very important point is that there's we have no evidence of Third Maccabees being part of the Old Latin translation. What's the Old Latin translation? It's a Jewish translation of the Old Testament based on the Septuagint, which was probably made sometime around the second Christian century. So there's no Third Maccabees in the Old Latin from this time period. That would suggest that the Septuagint didn't have this book in it, or at least the copy of the Septuagint didn't have it for the Old Latin, or maybe they just didn't think it was canonical. But regardless, it's not in the Old Latin. And Third Maccabees apparently was also omitted in the versions of the Septuagint translated by Jerome into Latin in the fourth Christian century. As Johnson notes, there are occasional allusions to the book in a few early Christian authors, exclusively to be found in the eastern half of the empire, and the only ancient translations of the book, Syriac and Armenian, 
were likewise products of Eastern Christianity. 3rd Maccabees was never translated into Latin, and there is no trace of influence in the Western half of the empire or in later Western art and literature. The book has continued to be read by Greek and Slavonic Orthodox Christians down to the modern day, as it is included within the Eastern Orthodox canon. There is no evidence at all that the book was read by Jews after the 2nd century CE. Now, I think this point is pretty weighty, that the entire Christian West seems to not even be aware of this book, and yet only spot indications in the East seem to be aware of it or accept 3rd Maccabees. This suggests to me that 3rd Maccabees was a later addition to the Septuagint. I don't think it goes all the way back to the first century Septuagint that Christ and the apostles had. Otherwise, how do you account for its entire absence in Latin? That just, to me, that doesn't make sense. And, and you know, how could the word of God be found only in one part of the church and, and not the entire church? If, to me, that points to a later point of addition, not an early one. So I think that's a strong point. When you add to that the silence in the New Testament, it's not looking good for Third Maccabees. When we look at lists in the early church uh, by individuals like Melito of Sardis, Cyril of Jerusalem, uh, Origen of Alexandria, Hilary of Poitiers, Athanasius, uh, Rufinus, Jerome, all of them omit any reference to Third Maccabees. It's simply not on anybody's list. It's certainly not on the North African Council's list of the fourth century. It's omitted in Hippo Regis in 393. It's omitted in the list of Carthage 3 at 397. It's omitted in Carthage 17 and 419, which is part of the African Code. So 3rd Maccabees was not part of the African Code. Uh, and of course, it's absent in Florence and Trent as well. It's also absent in early papal lists like the decree of Damasus in 383 and Pope Innocent I in 405. None of them mention 3rd Maccabees. It's entirely absent. So again, what's the evidence for the canonicity of 3rd Maccabees? Right now, as it stands, there doesn't seem to be any. Okay. But we need to be complete, though, because there is one early list that does include 3rd Maccabees, and that's found in a work called the Apostolic Constitutions, specifically in the last book, which is the Apostolic Canons, specifically Canon 85. So this is what Canon 85 says. The books to be held in reverence and regarded as holy by all of you, clergy and laity, are of the Old Testament, five of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, one of Jesus, son of Nave, one of Judges, one of Ruth, four of Kingdoms, two of Chronicles of the Book of Days, two of Esdras, one of Esther, three of Maccabees, one of Job, one Psalter, three of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Canticle of Canticles. Of the twelve prophets, one book. One of Esaias, one of Jeremiah, one of Ezekiel, one of Daniel. Apart from these, you ought to teach your children the wisdom of the most learned Sirach. In ours, that is, the New Testament, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, fourteen epistles of Paul, two epistles of Peter, three of John, one of James, one of Jude. Two epistles of Clement, and the constitutions in eight books addressed to you bishops through me, Clement, which are not to be divulged to all because of the secret things in them, and the acts of us apostles. So you can see here a reference to three of Maccabees. So it affirms first, second Maccabees, and third Maccabees. So this is the first solid affirmation of third Maccabees that's out there. And this comes from a later work. Again, I believe it's in the fourth century. It's usually dated. But there's problems, though. And William Albrecht, David Zavaris, myself, uh, we talked about the problems with apostolic constitutions and the apostolic canons. Uh, the biggest problem is actually the fact that it's passed off as a forgery. Now, 
I'm not saying it's pseudonymic, you know, that maybe they adopted a pseudonym for the work. No, it's a forgery. It's attempting to pass off on the reader that it's an authentic work of somebody when it really isn't. And you can see that right here in the 85th canon. Notice when it lists the New Testament canon, it gives the books of the New Testament. Then interesting enough, it has the two epistles of Clement. So first and second Clement are also considered part of the New Testament. And the constitutions itself, apparently, uh, which are eight books addressed to you bishops through me, Clement, which is not to be divulged at all because of the secret things in them. So it's canonical New Testament book that apparently wasn't supposed to be really that public. Very strange. And here, of course, you see the attribution to Pope St. Clement of Rome, first century apostolic father. This is not part of the apostolic writings. Also, it's at the very end, notice this says, and the acts of us apostles. So it refers to the acts of the apostles, and it has the audacity to include its author as one of the apostles that's included in Acts. So our first affirmation, strong affirmation of Third Maccabees, comes from, I guess you could say, a really dubious source. Not very reassuring. It's also mentioned in the pseudo-Athanasian work, Synopsis of the Sacred Scripture, it's mentioned among the disputed books of the Old Testament, which reads as follows. Among the disputed books of the Old Testament, of which we spoke previously, such as the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of Jesus son of Sirach, and Esther and Judith and Tobit, also these are to be counted, the four books of the Maccabees, Ptolemaic books, the Psalms and Odes of Solomon, Susanna. These are disputed books of the Old Testament. So it's said to be spoken against. Um, again, it's not a positive affirmation, but it is mentioned as being part of the Old Testament. So it's not entirely a negative attribution. Uh, one of the earliest references we have comes from Eusebius's Chronicles, which is repeated by uh, Jerome, I believe. And here's what the Chronicles say. Ptolemy Philopater became the fourth king of Egypt for 17 years. The events which are described in the third book of Maccabees took place under this king Philopater. The Hebrew books of Maccabees date the rule of the Greeks from this year, but these books have not been accepted as part of Holy Scripture. Okay, so interesting, it just makes a reference to the third book of Maccabees. It's not affirming it. And in the second quotation from the 116th Olympiad, it says the Hebrew books of Maccabees date the rule of the Greeks from this year. And uh, so it's referring that these books point to this date. These books have not been accepted as part of Holy Scripture. So, yeah, so not exactly a glowing endorsement of third Maccabees. Another work we have is the Strictometry of Nietzsche Forus, um, who places the three books of Maccabees among those that are not recognized and gainsaid in the church. So it's not, it's uh, certainly not a glowing endorsement of three books of Maccabees. And then you have Sincelius. Um, and it's interesting that he quotes uh, the letter of Aristias with the formula just as it is in Ptolemaic Tos, it is written. And this led Emil Schur to suggest that perhaps uh, Third Maccabees may have at one time circulated uh, along with the letter of Aristias, which is a pseudo epigraphic work. Aris Charles also adds some other details as well. Uh, again, later sources, um, nothing very solid. Okay, so when we put all these facts together, what does it show us? Well, it, I think it shows that the pedigree, the canonical pedigree of Third Maccabees is wanting and uh, is wanting very badly. There's extremely few 
positive references about third Maccabees. It was entirely unknown in the West. It was known solely in the East and somewhat sporadically in the East. Uh, later on, whenever it's mentioned, it's usually mentioned in uh, not an affirmation, but uh, that it's spoken against. Um, it was not part of the North African councils, and therefore it wasn't part of the affirmation at the Council of Florence, the reunion council with um, Jacobites, and therefore it wasn't affirmed at Trent. So uh, there you have it, folks. Um, like I said, I personally think it lacks the pedigree to be considered canonical. So if someone were to insist that it is a canonical writing based on the evidence in the early church, I think that would be a uphill battle to say the least. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give a thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't subscribed and you'd like to, please subscribe as well. It helps the algorithm, helps spread the word about our channel. And also uh, myself and William Albrecht on Patreon, if you want to support us. It enables us to buy more reference works, to do more research, and produce videos like this. So we appreciate your support. Till next time, I'm Gary Machuda. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.